Being able to store, hold on to, and release urine when appropriate is an undervalued skill that is often taken for granted until it is lost. The mechanisms that underlie urine storage and voiding, or micturition, are complex and rely on an intricate interplay of anatomical structures and neuronal signaling networks. Learning how all this works is not only important to understand the numerous causes of incontinence, but it also gives us a great example of a complex reflex that we can use to better understand other similar processes. My name's Connor, and today we're going to learn the anatomy and physiology behind micturition, or urination. Welcome to Anatomy 101. The kidneys, ureters, bladder and urethra form the urinary tract, divided into upper and lower parts. We've covered the details of the upper urinary tract in a previous tutorial, but today the focus is on what's happening down south. Here we're looking at the bladder from an anterior view, with a cut taken through it in coronal section. The bladder wall itself has a fascinating composition, but for today's session all we need to be aware of is the thick muscular wall that lines it, known as the detrusor muscle. This word comes from the Latin root meaning to push out, and that's exactly what the muscle does to urine. Draining into the bladder from the kidneys are the paired ureters. These pass down the retroperitoneum just anterior to the psoas major muscle to enter the bladder at an oblique angle. The ureters form the base of a triangular structure in the inferior bladder known as the trigone. This is smoother than the rest of the internal bladder wall and has its apex at the beginning of the urethra. The urethra is a single muscular tube that carries urine out of the bladder and into the outside world. It's about 22 centimeters long in men and 5 centimeters long in women. Here we're looking at the male urinary tract. We can tell this due to the presence of the prostate. The tract looks very similar in women and, aside from the prostate, has most of the same structures. The urethra first passes through the prostate on its way out of the male bladder. It then continues inferiorly to pass through the pelvic diaphragm before entering the penis. We'll discuss all of these structures in more detail in later sessions. The most important structures to be aware of for today's session are the two narrowings of the urethra, known as the internal urethral sphincter, which is formed inside the detrusor muscle, and the external urethral sphincter, which sits in the deep perineal pouch and is derived from the levator ani muscles. The internal sphincter is under involuntary control, whilst the external sphincter can be opened and closed voluntarily. Taking a look at the bladder from the side, we can see a few more important structures. First, we can see how closely related the bladder is to the bones of the pelvis, with the pubic symphysis sitting just anterior to it. Next, we can see the pairs of ligaments running from either side of the prostate to attach to the pubis. These help anchor the urethra in place. In men, they are known as the pubo-prostatic ligaments, whilst in women they are known as the pubo-vesical ligaments. Coming off the apex of the bladder is the median umbilical ligament, which is a remnant of the embryological uracus. Finally, the area between the bladder and the pubic symphysis is known as the retropubic space of Retzius, and is usually filled with fat and connective tissue. Now let's take a closer look at the nerves that supply the bladder. Here's the bladder and ureters in situ, with the bony pelvis and part of the vertebral column on show. Running in close proximity to it is the abdominal aorta and its first major divisions, the paired common iliac arteries. The first important nerve we'll look at is the pudendal nerve. This starts from the ventral rami of S2, S3 and S4. It has a number of very important divisions, but the most relevant to micturition is the perineal nerve. This nerve follows an interesting route to reach the external urethral sphincter, which exhibits somatic or voluntary control. This means you can choose to open and close your external urethral sphincter via the pudendal nerve. Also coming from the S2, S3 and S4 nerve routes are the pelvic splanchnic or sometimes just pelvic nerves. These travel a short distance to reach the inferior hypogastric plexus before they are distributed to all parts of the pelvis. In particular, the pelvic nerves innervate the detrusor muscle of the bladder. They carry parasympathetic innervation, meaning their actions are not under voluntary control. Looking higher up, we have five more nerve roots that contribute to the innervation of the bladder. These are T10, T11, T12, L1 and L2. These nerves travel inferiorly via the sympathetic chain or in the preaortic plexus to reach the superior hypogastric plexus. From here they coalesce into the hypogastric nerves, which carry sympathetic innervation to the detrusor muscle and to the internal urethral sphincter. The action of the hypogastric nerve is also not under voluntary control. Okay, that's a lot of anatomy, so let's have a quick summary. From the sacral level comes the somatic pudendal nerve, which innervates the external urethral sphincter. Also from the sacral level is the parasympathetic pelvic nerve, 
which innervates the detrusor muscle. And finally, from the lower thoracic and upper lumbar levels is the sympathetic hypogastric nerve, which innervates the detrusor muscle and the internal urethral sphincter. The other two nervous structures that we should be aware of are both in the brain. The first is a region known as the periaqueductal gray, which plays a key role in coordinating autonomic functions. And the second is the pontine micturition center, which is a part of the pons involved in the regulation of micturition. All right, let's finish by covering the physiological process of micturition and see how the structures that we've discussed play a role. Before urine can be expelled, it must be stored. The pelvic nerve senses when the bladder has very little urine in it and subsequently reflexively stimulates the hypogastric nerve. This sympathetic nerve acts on the detrusor to relax it and acts on the internal urethral sphincter to contract it, helping to keep urine inside the bladder. In the brain, the periaqueductal gray acts to suppress the pontine micturition center, reducing the desire to urinate. The lack of action of the pontine micturition center means the pelvic nerve is inhibited, also relaxing the detrusor and the pudendal nerve is stimulated, contracting the external urethral sphincter. All of this acts to hold in urine and reduces the urge to wee. However, when the bladder is suitably full and an appropriate place is found, the voiding stage may begin. This is initiated by rapid signaling of the pelvic nerves, which communicate up the spinal cord with the periaqueductal gray. The periaqueductal gray then communicates with the rest of the brain, in particular the prefrontal cortex, to see if it is appropriate to urinate in the current situation. If it's not, the pontine micturition center continues to be suppressed and you hold the urine in, at least up to a point. However, if it's time to go, then the suppression of the pontine micturition center is released and a signal is sent downwards into our three nerves. The parasympathetic pelvic nerves are stimulated, contracting the detrusor. The sympathetic hypogastric nerves are inhibited relaxing the internal urethral sphincter. And the pudendal nerve is also inhibited, relaxing the external urethral sphincter. All of this begins to push urine out of the bladder and into the toilet, hopefully. This process is an example of a spinobulbospinal reflex, where the spinal cord signals to the brain, which signals back to the spinal cord. While mostly autonomic, a somatic control of the pudendal nerve allows us to hold onto urine even when the urge to go is unbearable. And there we go, that's the anatomy and physiology of micturition. There's a lot more content we can cover here in terms of the pelvic floor, ureters and types of incontinence. So if you enjoyed today's session, be sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel. It's the best way to let us know that you got something out of it. See you next time and have a great day.